No, but I'm working on a project at Northwestern University about the Hare Krishna Society here in the Chicago area. Oh, Hare Krishna um, Society, right. Yes. <clears throat> and, um, forgive me. <clears throat> uh, and uh, part of my specific focus within my group is what draws people to the center um, and how many of them stick around for the ride. So uh, right off the bat, I was just curious if you have anything to say about uh, recruiting tactics or, you know, the general appeal of ISCON in the U.S. Um, well, there's basically... I mean, I mean, we, we, we present the chanting of Hare Krishna and um, the philosophy. People come, even in the Bhagavad Gita, which is one of our central texts, Krishna says that people come to him for different reasons. Some people because they're in distress, some people because they're searching for the truth, so to speak, with a capital T, or because they somehow intuitively understand Krishna. Um, some people, according to the Bhagavad Gita, which of course teaches reincarnation, some people uh, have cultivated this knowledge in a previous life, and so they sort of revive it in this life. In more, let's say, worldly terms, um, well, I, I think that applies. People have different needs and different purposes, and um, they, you know, they come for different reasons, but... Uh, I mean, does that make any sense? I mean, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, absolutely. Um, when you say we, we, are you saying that um, you yourself uh, follow the Hare Krishna movement? Uh, I have, yeah. I I've been practicing bhakti yoga since 1969, actually. But I've also been sort of a prominent critic of the movement. I mean, from within inside, and uh, I personally feel that um, one of the how should I put it, the, the success of the Hare Krishna movement in the last 20 or, oh my God, it's 2014. You could say maybe 20, 25 years at least has been predominantly among the Indian community. And so um, one of the critiques that I have made is that um, the essential teachings or the essential spiritual knowledge and the and the basic practice has been very much mixed with a um, how should I put it sort of an attachment to an Indian ethnic traditions like dressing in certain ways or cooking in certain ways certain forms of architecture or music and I I believe that social science and history show that if a new religious movement in a particular society, if it presents itself in a way which is radically different in everything from the host society, that it, uh, it, it's very, very difficult to, uh, to grow. And I think that's been the experience of the, of the Hare Krishna movement. Um, there's, I think there's been sort of a, um, mixing essential spiritual teachings with a sort of an uncritical and ahistorical belief in the necessity of or the importance of certain external ethnic details. Mm -hmm. So would you say that there has all the same been an increase in the variety of the cultures within the temple recently? Because I didn't notice not a majority, but you know, a fair amount of people of uh, ethnic backgrounds that were not Indian. Yeah, there, it's definitely multicultural, no question about that. It's definitely multicultural. Um, so it's not, ex it, it, they don't, if you, if you go on Sunday, did you go on Sunday? Uh, I have been on Sundays before, yes. From what I've heard, I, I mean, I haven't seen it so much myself, Chicago, but I've heard that it's, it's predominantly an Indian congregation. Is that your experience? Uh, yes, but I think that I was surprised at how many, uh, white people I saw there, and also, um, 
it seemed like a fair amount of Russian people, which was interesting to me. Yeah, yeah, the movement has done very well in Russia. I think our experience has been that uh, we've done extremely well in India. We've done well in Russia or the Ukraine. We have not done nearly as well in truly Western countries. If you follow modern geopolitical events, that whole problem with Russia invading Ukraine and so on, I, I mean, I think it, it's it's quite obvious that Russia, in in some significant ways, is not really a Western country. Mm -hmm. And Do you, yeah, well, so would you say it's because it's not a Western country that it has adopted uh, Hare Krishna so well? Um, yeah, there, there's there's a variety of historical factors there in Russia, in terms of their indigenous culture, in terms of their proximity. I mean, Russia is as close to India in a sense as America is to Mexico. Right. And so uh, the, uh, I mean, the former Soviet countries in, in, in Central Asia, even even practically border India, so some of them. So it's, for example, if you fly from New York to, to Mexico, somewhere in Mexico, it's gonna be, you know, whatever it is, like, you know, a five hour trip or something, but, um, so, if, mm -hmm. so that's about, I mean, if you fly from Moscow to India, it's, it's not, it's about the same. So, so, so I think they, um, yeah, because of a variety of cultural and historical and geographic factors, they, plus India, India is part of the Indo-European civilization. It's, um, and if you see it in the Sanskrit language, the, the ancient sacred language of India is very much an Indo-European language. So the European, so Russia, somehow people in Russia, they, um, yeah, it's, it's, they, they experience, let's say, they, they experience Hare Krishna movement somewhat differently. And, and, and we do make large numbers of Russian devotees. And even if you go to India now, some of the main uh, places where we have very, very large spiritual communities with thousands of people and, it, it's uh, a very large number of Russians. So, but in, in, in countries which are really Western countries like America, Canada, Australia, Germany, England, France, Spain, Italy, I mean, really Western countries, um, the movement's surviving and it's internally, I would say, fairly well organized and solid, but it's not, it's not really like a house on fire. It's not. It's not growing. It's not growing dynamically. Certainly not like it did in the '60s and '70s. And and I have been um, sort of uh, speaking out very strongly about the need to pay attention to history and social science and and present things in a way that's more comfortable within the culture cultural comfort zone of Western people. So I think in Chicago, May first to third, or something like that. They're actually having a conference, which is going to focus on how to reach Western people. Mm. And um, I, anyway, I don't want to take credit, but I, I think it's because of we've been pushing that they, there there is some response now, and people are starting to realize that uh, we do have to focus much more on trying to reach Western people. So, yeah, Chicago is a good center. It's. Um, Traditional, it's what I would call a traditional ISKCON center. Mm -hmm. Now, besides being, um, oh, first of all, if you don't mind me asking, what um, led you to the Hare Krishna movement back when you first started with the uh, Bhakti Yoga, is that what you said? Yes, I um, personally was uh, anxious to find knowledge. I, w I was really looking for knowledge. I wanted to understand myself and God and what does the world mean and why was I born and all those things. And uh, so there were two things about the Hare Krishna movement back then that I found compelling. Number one, the knowledge. I felt, I felt this was the most coherent, complete explanation of life. It, it, I didn't think that other paths were wrong or bad. I wasn't really and I wasn't fanatical. I just thought that this is the most comprehensive explanation of everything. And secondly, uh, I saw that there was a powerful practice that, that people were really living a spiritual life. It wasn't just a nice doctrine 
but but people the it was possible to really apply it to live a spiritual life so basically philosophy and practice i was um I said, I wasn't sectarian. I didn't think this is right and other things are wrong. I just thought this is the best way to go. It's like if you choose to buy a certain car, it doesn't mean you think other cars are evil. You just think this is the best car for your money. Right. <clears throat> now, did you um, continue or have you continued with, um, I guess, the faith you were born into in addition to the Hare Krishna movement? Or have you kind of moved solely into this realm? Um... I was born in a Jewish family, and uh, I, yeah, I mean, I, I continue. So I continue to accept Judaism as a, in some ways, inspiring thing. And I know when I'm around my family, we attend various, um, like, like we have certain, you know, some religious occasions. I certainly go and participate enthusiastically. So, so there's no question of like rejecting it like this is a false religion. I mean, that would be kind of stupid. Right. So, um, yeah, I still happily, enthusiastically participate whenever the occasion arises in, in Jewish services. Okay, so it, it's interesting that you talk so much about knowledge because other people that I've spoken with um, have, you know, um, discussed similar desires and um, uh goals when they were, you know, when they came to the Hare Krishna movement. So I was curious, do you look at it more of an, as an intellectual, as a, a, a place for intellectual expression, or would you consider it a religion? Um, to me, it is a spiritual path, and people are different. I mean, some people are not that intellectual. Some people even are anti-intellectual. Like you, like certain new age cliches, like it's, you know, it's not just about your head. You have to be in your heart. That kind of stuff. I mean, I mean, certainly we have to. I mean, we all have feelings and emotions, and 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 that's certainly part of it. Whatever whatever we choose to do in life, we choose to do because we we feel that we should. There's always feeling about. It. But um, I guess it's myself. It reflects my own nature. For me, uh, I could not give my heart to something or really commit to something unless I clearly understood what I was doing, why I was doing it, what the result is going to be. I needed a roadmap. Mm -hmm. And so for me, particularly, um, I, there was no question of committing myself to a spiritual path or joining anything unless I had a very clear, convincing understanding of exactly what I was doing. So um, other people are different. Other people just think it's beautiful or, you know, people have different reasons. And um, some people, if it feels right, that's all they need. And they don't care so much about the logic of it. And so are, people are different. Oh yeah, yeah. My PhD was basically in this tradition, and um, and I I'm sort of a lifelong learner. I'm uh, my undergraduate degree at UCLA was in uh, world religions, and I'm I'm sort of a lifelong student, student of history, student of religions, and I uh, I'm you know always try to learn something every day. Did you? Um, come across the movement as a, a student? Yes. Did you know that beforehand? <clears throat> uh, yeah, I, I first discovered it in Berkeley, California, way back when, when I was uh, I was an undergraduate student at Berkeley. Okay. Um, and so, Christian, tell me correct me if I'm wrong, you, you teach at Harvard now? I don't teach at Harvard. Um, I got my PhD at Harvard. Oh, okay. And uh, I... I've lectured at Harvard and Oxford and Cambridge and all the famous universities I've, you know, spoken and done little seminars and things. So at this point, I'm focusing more on writing. I occasionally teach. I 
several years ago at the invitation of a friend of mine who was the head of the religion department at the University of Florida. I taught a um, couple semesters there. So I don't, thank God, I don't need the money. And uh, so right now I'm focusing more on writing. I um, I just finished a translation of Bhagavad Gita, and I did sort of almost the first uh, modern systematic theology of the Gita based on the Sanskrit text. That should be coming out very soon. I have a few other books coming out, and I'm working on a novel as well. And I also I also um, how should I put it? Um, I've sort of been one of the pioneers within ISKCON of. Uh, how would you call it, the back-to-school movement, you know, encouraging devotees to be educated, to go to college, to get degrees, to study, try to understand our tradition in a rational, <laughs> historically-based way. So I, particip I participate in all kinds of in academic forums and um, trying to come to, for my own edification, and, and also try to help others to come to, sort of a, a, a faithful but a rational hermeneutic in terms of how do you reasonably understand sacred texts and what is the actual history of our tradition and why are we doing what we're doing and can we separate things that are truly, let's say, from our point of view of spiritual science, can we separate that from things that are merely ethnic or traditional but, but not really objectively necessary? And, and that's so, so really what I've been doing, I've started this international program called Krishna West, and it's, it's actually growing very quickly. We just started a year ago. And it's, it's spreading all over Western Europe and America and South America. And, and it's the idea uh -huh. of trying to present Krishna consciousness in a way that does not require people to adopt unnecessary features of Indian culture. Well, yeah, I mean, it's almost like the difference between cultural and ethnic. I mean, of course, cultural can mean ethnic, like you can talk about Oaxacan culture or, I don't know, you know, Bavarian culture. But um, I feel that there's there's extraordinary knowledge here. It's, it's, a, um, it's one of the great knowledge, wisdom traditions of the world. There's a powerful spiritual practice. And so I want to facilitate the practice, make it easier for people and not put up unnecessary hoops that people have to jump through. So, okay. so from my point of view, using what is now actually sort of archaic Indian dress, because Indians don't even dress that way anymore, but using certain kinds, sort of old fashioned forms of Indian dress or always having to do music with Indian styles or cook Indian preparations. I, I, it's nice. And if someone likes it, you know, that's certainly their prerogative, but it's just not essential. It's not necessary. It's not the essence of what we're trying to do. And so I'm, I'm convinced that giving the public the impression that somehow it's all one package, like if you want serious access to the spiritual knowledge and the spiritual practice, you also have to immerse yourself in, in, in sort of, um, archaic Indian culture. I, uh, I think philosophically and historically, that's that's incorrect. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, <clears throat> one last thing, I was just curious. Do you know of any statistics about um, the numbers of people who join ISKCON per year? Is there any kind of statistic about that in any way? Uh, unfortunately, I think we we that's I think we don't really monitor those things nearly as closely as we should. Unfortunately, we, um, I mean, in, in various ways, the movement is getting, becoming more organized, but I, I think, uh, no, in that way, that's, that's really missing. I, I think in general, the fact we don't monitor that, I think is part of the problem in the sense that uh, I think there's a need to more, in a, in a more rational, in a more efficient way, approach the whole issue of uh, trying to spread the knowledge. In the, in the center? In the movement, you mean? Oh, no. no. In the 
Oh, oh, not in Chicago. Yes, I'm uh, one of the, I guess you could say, one of the most senior members of ISCON. I you was an official title. I was, well, I'm a sannyasi, which is, you know, sort of like the, the title, and then I'm a guru, and we have a governing body, which I was a member of for about 30 years. Wow, I was okay. In, I was in charge of, <laughs> what's that? First word, um... Oh, sannyasi? S a n n y a s i. It means a uh, someone who would, you know, sort of toward the end of life, uh, after they've lived life, sort of takes a vow of celibacy and dedicates himself to teaching. Okay, and so were you like a, a teacher within the the movement for like, uh, uh, you know, for daily lessons? What you know, what was what would that entail? Uh, lecturing, giving classes, writing books. I'm, I guess, one of the most senior teachers in the movement. Okay, and how long have you said 59 was when you first, uh... Uh, six, 69. So it's a little over 45 years now. 69, okay. And did you immediately just become very involved? Very what? Did you become uh, very involved immediately? Yeah, that was 1969. We were pretty radical. So when I joined, I just <laughs> I, I just went all the way. And um, yeah, we were young and revolutionary and just dived into things. And then you wrote a, uh, your dissertation on it. Okay. I didn't write my dissertation on, it wasn't autobiographical. It was on actually on, on just a topic within the general area. Of uh, okay. because Vaishnavism, okay. what we're doing has a long history. It goes back thousands of years. There have been many great scholars and teachers within the tradition. It's it's practically the main branch of Hinduism, Vaishnavism, mm -hmm. and, and so um, yeah, I I I, I translated a uh, an ancient Sanskrit text for my dissertation. Okay, 